Hi there, this is Jessica. Welcome to my channel. Thanks to China's growing international influence and better career prospects, more and more people from abroad are choosing to come live, work, or study here, which helps to bring people from different backgrounds, cultures, and beliefs together. What are your perceptions when working with people of another nationalities? And what is the biggest culture shock when living in China? What is missing in cross-cultural communication today? Joining me today, I have two guests online featuring Jerry Green. He is Australian-British and he's also a social media commentator. And also another guest is Zach Bomberger from the United States. He is a startup entrepreneur from Navi Tong International. Hi, thank you for joining me today. Hi, how's it going? Yeah, thank you so much. So first of all, I would like each of you to have a brief self-introduction. How about like uh, Jerry go first? Thank you, and thank you for the invitation. Um, Jerry Gray, my name, I've been in China, I live in Guangdong, I'm currently in Yunnan, this is a hotel reception that I'm in now, so forgive me if there's any interruptions, but it's a very quiet hotel. Um, I've been in China since 2004, came here for an eight-month contract, uh, liked it, decided to stay, and uh, now I'm married, live in uh, Zhongshan in Guangdong province, and I've actually retired, which is why I call myself a social media commentator, because I don't have a job anymore. I'm just a retiree who's happened to make his home in Guangdong. And that's basically me. I, I support China in a, because I've seen things go well. Uh, and um, I get a lot of criticism on international media for that, but uh, I, I'll continue to do so. How about Zach? Please introduce yourself. First of all, also, thank you very much for the invitation to join the program. I really appreciate it. Um, my name is Zach Baumberger, um, and as you mentioned, I'm an American. I've been in Beijing for the last five years, since 2018. And like Jerry, once um, once I arrived in Beijing, I kind of never left as well. It's just, I've traveled, to, um, I've traveled to at least eight provinces within China, several different cities, um, whether they were big cities like Shanghai or smaller, much smaller cities like uh, Xiaogan in Hubei province. I have traveled all over the country on a language culture journey to understand, you know, this country, this um, society that's so much different than my own. And after college, I really wanted to travel somewhere to a new country to really explore it. and. You know, I packed my bags in 2018 and I never looked back. I should say you speak good or great Chinese. That why China or why Chinese? That's a very fascinating question. As an American who came from a small, a small state called Kansas, like right in the heartland of the U.S., most people consider it to be white American, you know, like white um, religious Bible Belt America. And so for me, from elementary school to high school, I really didn't meet any other people who looked different or were different than me in terms of their background. When I first started my uh, college journey at K State, uh, Kansas State University, I was lucky enough in my first semester to meet a nice gentleman who's now been my, my best friend of Beijing um, of 10 years from Beijing. And so because I met him, and then his ex-girlfriend at the time, I really started to become interested in meeting people from different countries and different cultures and mother languages. And so because of that, I, well, I was really intrigued by the language itself and then decided to start studying it formally in 2013. And it's been almost 10 years now since I started that. Um, it, language, language learning is, absolutely a process, you know, it's always a trial error process because what you've learned in school and then the, you know, the real application of it are going to be completely different at a time. Yeah. And I think that uh, learning a language is not the language or characters or words itself, but about getting to know more about the culture behind it. Especially, you know, China is such a food-loving culture, and so, in you know, in English, when we see someone, like either an old friend or a, a new person, and we say we greet them, we say hello. Usually, after that, we ask, "How are you?" But in Chinese, it's completely different. 
Um, you don't say, you don't go up to someone and be like, ni hao, ni hao, ni hao, ni hao ma? Like, no, no, no. Like, you do, no. when you see someone, you can ask them, like, ni chur le ma? Or, yes. you know, in Beijing, chur le ma ni? So, you know, it's, it's very, um, it's very fascinating how when you use language to talk with people, you learn more about the, the history, the culture, and just all the little, um, all the little facts and pieces of information behind it. Exactly. I totally agree. Actually, I know Jerry. I, I follow Jerry on Twitter and YouTube for quite a long time. I know you are a social media commentator or social media influencer, basically sharing your uh, stories, Jerry's take on China, by cycling around China and telling stories, presenting stories from China from your own perspective. And uh, I know your story, uh, the YouTube video titled uh, How China Changed My Perceptions of It. So what uh, motivated you to film it in 2022? Yeah, uh, China did change my perceptions. I, I think when I arrived here, I arrived here with the usual Western perceptions of China being a little bit backward sort of country. And, and there's a lot of things that have changed since then that, that have have corrected those perceptions. And part of it is when I first came, it was quite polluted. It was a little bit less developed than it is now, but certainly the city I'm living in, it's changed enormously. So in that respect, China has changed, but I think what really changed was me. It really did change when I, the first bike ride that I did, when myself and a friend, we traveled across China from the border of Macau all the way to the border of Kazakhstan by bike. And, wow. and that took us across some fantastic regions, but particularly the desert regions of Ningxia, Gansu. Uh, we touched into Inner Mongolia and Mo all of Xinjiang, from, from the Xinjiang Sha and the east of Xinjiang to Korgash in the west of Xinjiang, across the Tian Shan Mountains. It's just fantastic. Across the Taklamakan. Mm -hmm. It's just an amazing experience. And neither of us could really speak a good Chinese. He couldn't speak a word. He didn't even know how to count to 10. It's been a, a really interesting experience how really China changed into a more tolerant, uh, more understanding, uh, uh, it probably made me a better person too. I think probably the Chinese people have made me a better person. Yeah. I think that uh, when you come to a different place or a different country, that the best way is definitely to immerse yourself inside the culture. I like how you uh, get to know more Chinese by cycling, right? Uh, visit different places and talk to the locals and immerse yourself into the culture, into the different people, and you can exchange ideas and you can talk with the locals. That's how we communicate with others, especially to a different culture. I actually, I ask uh, this question to many of my foreign friends here in China. And uh, I think I will ask you this question, Jerry, as well is, uh, but I, I think that will be a little bit hard because you've been here for 18 years. What kind of perceptions of China do you have? Can you still remember before coming? And what has changed the most beside yourself over the past 18 years? I'd have to say infrastructure. I, on my, on my first week at school, we were, we were learning about, the, I was learning about the area. I was teaching a, a bunch of uh, high schoolers. Um, they, it was university preparation. And they said they're going to build a, 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 train, a train station here that will take us direct to Beijing. And I mm -hmm. kind of laughed at that. So yeah, we'll see that then when that happens. And someone said, they're going to build a bridge to, to Hong Kong too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was, no way that's yeah. ever. I actually went back to the staff room at lunchtime and I got a map to show them the distance from Hong Kong to Zhongshan. But then they built it a few years later. And it's there yes. now. I've been on it. I've used it a few times. So infrastructure would probably be the, the huge one. And also bureaucracy. Um, I would mm -hmm. say that it's much easier to get anything done now. You, you pick up the phone, if there's a problem, you dial one, two, three, four, five in any city and something will happen. So I would say bureaucracy has been, been cut, red tape has been cut, and it's just much faster to get around. It took 10 hours to get to here. We're, we're pretty close to the border of Tibet and it took 10 hours to get here from Guangdong. 
It's pretty amazing. How about Zach? Uh, the question for you that would be what brought you to China in 2018? And uh, what kind of like what aspects of life in China do you find most attractive? I agree with him um, completely. Like when I before I came in 2018, I also asked myself those questions. Does China have the same products as I do in the U.S.? Or um, is China really this backwater third world country that a lot of cartoon movies like uh, Hua Mulan, you know, the famous Mulan mm-hmm. cartoon movie really um, makes it look like. And I, and so even though I had many of my friends tell me, you know, their hometowns were like this, or you can go onto Google and you can search up pictures of Beijing, Shanghai, some other bigger cities and even smaller towns, you still don't really believe it until you're in country. And, and for me, that was, that was one of the big, the biggest, I think, learning experiences was that you can't really believe everything that everyone tells you. You should really experience it yourself first and then come to, you know, your own sort of um, understanding, your own conclusion. Even though, you know, I work here as a startup entrepreneur, at the same time, I'm more focused on talking to the locals and to actually get an idea of like, what is the real China in their perspective? For and Mm -hmm. so when I talk to them in Chinese, especially like some of the older, the older people in their, you know, from their, in their fifties to their eighties, you really get like this different perspective that you never would be able to see if you were back in the U S or if you just stuck with your um, English speaking friends, it's really fascinating after being here for a few years that when Chinese people say, you know, that their English skills are not very good, actually, they're probably a lot better than you expect than they uh, lead you on to the belief. Humility is, it's a, you, know, you said humble, Zach, and I think that, that humility is, is it's, it's actually nationwide. It's, it's a national mm. characteristic of mm-hmm. Chinese people that they have Absolutely. that humility. We say, can you, if we show you ma, eat and then they'll also a little. Yeah. And, yeah okay it's yeah. always better than my chinese i think that this is another experience that foreigners may not exactly get accustomed to or you may not like get used to at first because in the first couple of years that i was here i have to admit that i kind of i would get a little frustrated or a bit annoyed um each mm-hmm. time a chinese person would say oh your chinese is really good or they would ask me the normal set of questions where are you from what do you do um do you, are you married? Um, what's your job like? You know, they'd, they'd ask all these very common questions and some of them we think to be a little invasive of our privacy as a Westerner because we usually don't ask strangers these questions, but they're just really curious. But now I really don't mind because I realize that they just um, don't have these opportunities to talk with a foreign national as often. And so they just, they want to understand. And I think that these type of, and these moments should be should be cherished as much as possible. Yeah, I agree. I think that uh, Chinese people would like to talk to foreigners who can speak Chinese Chinese language well, because they would have a connection, as I've mentioned, that once you learn the language so well, you know the culture. For Western people, you would think this is kind of offensive of my, my, my personal information. But for us, that would be a topic, just like in Chilama, or yes, where you're from, the basic daily conversation topics. But I'm really curious about what kind of stereotypes you've come across as an Australian British or as an American in China. I find they don't. Chinese people don't have stereotypes of us. They're very, very really? open about, this is my experience. Um, mm-hmm. I, I find that people, right now at the moment, Australian media is is full on anti-China, full on. Mm. We're, we're talking about a war. Uh, China is just about to invade Taiwan and then will roll across and invade Australia. That's in the media right now. And Chinese people don't have a stereotype about it. They don't think, wow, Australia is being hostile. All they think is, all my friends say, what's wrong with Australia? Why don't they like us? And it's not like the Chinese people dislike anybody else. They just curious as to what's going wrong here did we do something that's that's how i view it when i'm talking to my chinese friends and that touches on a very interesting point because i also feel that media has a very large um very big impact about how we view others 
to be in my perspective i do believe that there are stereotypes but it, most of those stereotypes they come from either uh, um their conversations with other chinese friends or from online media from social media you know platforms like uh, douyin shahongshu i you know red red book and kuaishou and then other sources of media and ways that people get information because if they've never had the opportunity to speak to a um, a foreign national like Jerry or I that then they they only have these mediums to get that kind of information to learn about the outside world and so um for us i really believe that it's our responsibility as citizens of the world to not you know not in an arrogant way of course but to share our culture to share who we are with others and to build that sort of mutual understanding between in this case between people of different nations because if we don't do that it's going to just be too much you know confusion or too, too much conflict mm-hmm. or even just too just not enough um there's not a, yeah. not enough willingness to actually understand where each of us comes from and i think that's mm-hmm. um and when it comes to living in a different country i feel that that's a really big and important if i may call it task that needs to be done because in our daily lives when when chinese people will ask us these questions like how much money do you make or um or why did you come to china you know some of these basic questions and they go into the more in depth ones these are the perfect opportunities um to have those conversations but then also ask you know reciprocate as well and ask people so where are you from and why did you want to come to this city why are you interested in this job you know to also be personal with them and and open up those doors of communication that can uh, cuz otherwise if you don't if you don't open yourself up to those channels of communication to those moments when you can talk with others that then you're just blocking yourself up you're blocking yourself off from so like so m- many experiences and really chances to understand the world around you and that's why i feel like exactly. um that's why i feel that even though i'm not a, i'm not a political person but i do believe that media does often distort the way that we view other people so we have to take it upon mm-hmm. ourselves to instead search you know look search out for those people take those opportunities and then we will really understand you know what the real the real picture is instead of what we're being exactly. told from others. Exactly. Well, actually people see what they want to see. They don't always see what you see. We are doing same things in slightly different ways. Well, actually in the earlier of 2020 when I started to do TikTok, the international version of Douyin, when I started to do TikTok, sharing stories on TikTok about uh, uh China situation back then when everything just started. Well, a lot of people online will blame Chinese people for making this chaos to the world and also blaming Chinese eating habits. So at that time I was really um, well, first of all, you need to do scientific research. There is no scientific evidence to prove saying that this comes from China or uh, about the the eating habits videos they are not filmed in China so the things that uh, you need to come to China and see what our street food will be like i never see eating strange food on chinese restaurants or 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 a street food uh, stands so these are some of the 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 buyers or some of the the things i've received so jerry i have a question for you cuz you are a social media like commentator and influencer how do you think of uh, your like preconceived no- notions did you have before coming to china and what do you think about it right now and what do you think uh, the media plays in shaping western views of china I would say that uh, when you read any any Western media, and this is American, Australian, uh, to a lesser extent New Zealand, but Canadian, British, any Western media, English language media that I read, and I read a lot of it, there's usually about, and I would say between two and ten percent truth in a story, and the rest of it is misinformation, which is either. depending on who wrote the story it's either they have been misinformed which is quite true uh, that has happens a lot or they misinterpreted something uh, so for example the guy who says that this this building is a prison 
when in fact it's a school. He's never been to China and he's looked at it from a satellite and he says this is a prison. He misunderstands that schools have high fences, they have security at the front gate, they have dormitories, they have canteens, and they have, I mean, their dormitories are small rooms with steel doors usually. And that is what a prison look at to this guy. So that's misinterpretation. He's not misinformed, he's misinterpreting, and that becomes misinformation. And then you've got people, people who work for both the ABC, the BBC, CNN, they are deliberately lying because they know the truth and they want to tell, they're deliberately misinforming. Now that happens a lot too. On, on Twitter, I've been blocked by almost every one of these because I challenge them each time. Why did you say that when you know that it's this? Block straight away. Yes. That's what happens. Yeah. They are deliberately misinforming and they will not allow a challenge. And this is the mm -hmm. press. This is this is the free press. And that's the problem that I found. And that's why I got into this. I didn't get in to do this at all. I got onto Twitter mm -hmm. in order to show my bike riding, to show China as I see China. And people kept mm -hmm. coming back at me saying, you can't go to Xinjiang. Yes, you can. BBC said you can't. Did they? Well, and I went looking, sure enough, BBC said, you can't, well, you can. So I challenged the BBC on this, I'm blocked. Well, mm -hmm. there's somebody telling lies here and it isn't me. That's the problem that I found with me with media, mainstream media. There are a few non-mainstream medias around. And since I started on that, I've actually started writing and contributing to Chinese media and also a couple of Western medias. And that has helped me get the message out there. What, what is actually happening with this is, is, is not really that great because 30,000 people might see mine, but there's another guy talking about anti-China stuff. He's making stuff up. He's misinterpreting, misinforming, or deliberately telling lies, and he's got a million views. So mm -hmm. I'm fighting a battle against, uh, uh, this is a flood of misinformation out there. And, and it's, it's coming at all levels. It's coming from academia, too. Academia, the think tanks, the defense force, everything. Everything is misinformation about China. So I, my view is that there's 2% there's to 10% truth in every story, and then the rest is embellishment on that story. Actually, we don't want to like persuade people to believe us or trust us. The thing we are doing is there's storytellers and we just present the stories. We are saying, we are, how, this is how we live, this is how we live our life. When most people talk to me about it, I say, what's your experience of China and why is it so different to mine? And the answer to that is usually, I've never been to China. Well, you know, you haven't been to China. Where are you getting your information? Check your sources because I'm in China telling you different. You're paid to say that, aren't you? That's that's the usual response. So it's, it's very difficult to win someone over when they have every single media item telling them something is wrong about China and only one guy. I mean, there's, I'm not alone. I do understand that. But there's a few of us out here saying that's wrong. And proving it. There are moments when people also come back and criticize me and say they say, Well, you're not you're not you're not an American anymore. You must be completely Chinese. And and my response to that is then how about you yourself come to China or go to a different country and spend many years there? The you know, you'll you'll start to understand that actually you're even though um even though you are you have your own nationality, you can still be part of a different country's culture and people and immerse yourself in it. Like cross-border communications or cross-cultural communication doesn't mean cross the border, but it more means that we extend our borders and to create new cultures and mix the cultures together. I know Jerry has been here for 18 years and Zach for five years. How do you integrate yourself into the local community? I know by like learning Chinese language, by cycling around the country or trying different cuisine in China or making Chinese food. How do you like integrate yourself into the local community? I didn't have much choice when I moved to Zhongshan because there was no other community to integrate with. Uh, I, I worked in an international school, but it was I, I had two two other foreign teachers working there. We have very little choice but to integrate with the local community mm. because I live in the local community. I, when I do work, I work in the local community. Most of my friends are Chinese. Most of my my wife's family are all Chinese. 
Mm. If we want to go to a foreign restaurant, we've got a couple of Italians. And in the area I live, there's, there's a couple of different parts of Jongsan which are quite westernized, but we don't have anything like a San Liton in, in Beijing. We've got nothing like that at all. There is no area which I would call the expat bubble. How about Zach? How do you integrate yourself into the local community? As I'm sure you both know, Beijing is very multicultural and being the capital of China, there are people from every walk of life here. And so you're going to find expats from pretty much any country you can imagine, and also Chinese people from essentially every province as well. So in 2018, I did make it, a, make it um, you know, purposeful that I go out to find other expats to connect with that could understand, you know, me and where I come from. But also for me, I go out to purposely find opportunities to connect with other Chinese people, whether it's um, in my community, which is very residential, or it's going to um, some language learning events where Chinese people want to practice their English and also expats want to practice their Chinese and we play games like Mahjong or Long Ren mm. uh, Ren Sha. Long Ren Sha. Just taking these opportunities to to engage in activities that Chinese people also engage in. You know, when your colleague asks, hey, Zach, have you had lunch yet? Do you want to go eat together? Say sure. So I would say linguistics is one. You know, of course, continually learning Chinese, expand your activity horizon. You know, I'm really terrible at playing mahjong, but I'm, I want to play that because it's a social activity. Once you get past that wall, they open up to you and then they can become, they, be, they become your best friends. Mm -hmm. um, an example that I have that I'll, I'll make it very brief is last year for Qingming Festival, I, <clears throat> I was taking an overnight train from Beijing to Shanghai to visit my mm -hmm. friends. And coincidentally, on that train, um, the, the people that were assigned, you know, that booked tickets and, you know, because um, because the train that I took was a Dongche, was an overnight sleeping car, a sleeping train. So one of the rooms that I was assigned to, you know, had four beds and I was on the top bunk. But then when I got mm -hmm. on the train, the people adjacent to me, they asked me, they asked me if I could switch rooms because they, um, because the rest of their family was in the same room that I originally booked. And it's like, okay, sure, no problem. And at the same time, one of my current friends, um, he he also was asked to switch rooms. So at that time, as we were both going into this, um, you know, into this little small train room with four beds, we saw each other and we were just like, hello. And we said, hello. And then we started talking and now it's been a year and a half and we're like best friends. That's really nice. That's so sweet. I really like <laughs> both of your stories. Yeah, the marriage story the green from Gary. Too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The marriage story from Jerry and the bullet train story from Zach. Okay, yeah. so yes, I agree that uh, humans are human. We are the same. We just come from different backgrounds or different cultures. We just do things slightly different. And this cultural exchange thing not just refers to the process of sharing knowledge, values, customs, or traditions between individuals or groups, but it's more like, I think it's more essential for promoting diversity, understanding, and the tolerance among different communities. So here is the, the next question that what do you think is the key in cross-cultural communication? And what do you think is missing these days? I actually have a master's degree in cross-cultural communication, but I don't know I the know answer. That. <laughs> I know that. I know that, Jerry, I know that. The, the answer this to this... You go first. I mean, it, it's open-mindedness. It's really, it's, it's all you've got to do. I mean, one of the main things when, when we came, or when I came to China, I would look at Chinese people doing something. Why do they do that? Why are they doing it like that? And, and then you start to realize that everything is different. Just a couple of weeks ago as an exercise, I'm working with a training company in Hong Kong. And as an exercise, they said, can you write down the top 10 irritations that you have about China. And I had to really think about this. And really what I had to do was go back 18 or 17 or 16 years to what used to get my get my goat up, you know, what used to rile me up. And and then I what I did instead of writing down the top 10 irritations, I wrote down the irritations 
Then I wrote down how to handle them. And then I wrote down the reason why they did this and why it was different to us. So I think that's all it is. It's a case of opening your mind, opening your eyes, looking at it. And, and I did this in a video which somebody, several people commented on. I said, take off the Western lenses and look at it through a different set of eyes. That's what we need to do. Instead of saying, I wish they wouldn't do that, let's look at the reason. Why are they shouting down the telephone at me? You know, because a generation ago, they were shouting across the fields at each other. That's how yes. people communicated in China just a, yes. a generation ago. So the older generation is still doing it to the younger generation. The younger generation are doing it to me. Little things like that. You know, why do they spit in the streets? Well, under traditional Chinese medicine, it's better to get this out. And if you think about it, it's a lot better than wrapping it up in a piece of cotton and putting it in your pocket, which is what my grandparents and parents used to do. So we didn't use tissues back then. We used cotton handkerchiefs. And we blow our nose and put them in our pocket and carry it home with us. What's the sense in that? It's much better to spit it out. I mean, it's where you spit it out that's important. And, you know, it could be bad manners to spit it out in the wrong place. But it's not bad manners mm -hmm. to spit it out. Uh, we eat with our fingers. This is a something you know, Chinese people spit bones onto the table. Well, that's terrible for us. But we eat with our fingers. And then when we finish, meal, we say, thanks very much for a lovely meal and shake hands with our fingers that have just been in our mouth. So when you start looking at these things from a different lens, you start seeing things very differently. And still for Jerry, what do you think is missing these days? Yes, I, I, think, I think that's the only thing that is missing. And there is a little bit of, particularly for Brits, uh, and, and this is very true of Brits, we Germans when we're on holiday. We don't like the Americans when we're traveling. We don't like anyone who's not British. That's the way we are. The old joke in, when you're arriving in China, you see um, Hong Kong and uh, Hong Kong, Macau and Taiwan nationals this way, uh, Chinese residents this way, foreigners this way. And my father would say, well, I'm British. Where do I go? <laughs> because he's not, he doesn't consider himself a foreigner anywhere in the world. It, it's, it's really is a very different psychology that we have that we, the Brits, tend to think of ourselves as kind of superior. When you mm. don't understand us, we shout louder at you. Uh, mm. That's the way we are. Why can't these people speak English? Well, because mm. we're in China, that's why. And that, that really is a fact. I've heard foreigners, I've heard English people say, why don't they speak English? Why don't you speak Chinese? Yes, That's the exactly. Uh, and really, exactly. it, does, it does take that kind of open-mindedness. You've got to stop mm. people and say, where are you? Why do you not speak their language? Because I'm British. Well, what are you doing in China? Uh, well, that's that's the story. You know, they, they, they've really got to open their minds up and understand that. And I and even though America, you know, is an is a is a salad bowl, and there are tons of different people there, I also think that America, you know, I, I'm that as an American, and I'm proud to be one. But I also think that in some ways that we're very arrogant. We think that we're the best. We're the best people. You know, we're the best nationality, and blah 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 blah. But what I do feel is that a lot of this does come back to what Jerry just mentioned that I cannot agree with more is the question of you're in China, so why can't you speak Chinese? I would add on to what Jerry um, already mentioned regarding open mindedness. I would also say as someone who practices mindfulness, that it's also about patience. And it's also about this this um this yearning to understand because in con in cross-cultural communication, it is a two-sided affair. It is not just one person talking and the other listening. So you need to practice, for example, active listening. When someone is talking with you and they're sharing your experiences, you need you you should first listen, hear what they're saying, process it, ask a follow-up question, and then from there. All, um, then there you can share your piece as well, share what you want to say. Because it, cause so, so much of communication, I feel, these days is about people um, dominating the conversation or them focusing more on what they want to say and that their ideas, that their beliefs, that their values, what they want, that what they want to communicate is much more superior than the other person. But that is not the case. We are human beings exactly. and, and, the world re and the world revolves around communication. So why can we not instead step back listen to what other people are telling us 
and then communicate from there. Instead of like look at other cultures, I do believe it's about let's look at ourselves, right? Uh, it's not just uh, asking like expats to speak Chinese, but it's also we can speak in English as well. <laughs> we can speak French, we can speak Italian, we can speak Korean, we can speak German. So it's more like underst mutual understanding towards each other. And I really like how uh, Zach put it is, uh, I may not agree what you believe, but I totally give you the right and give you the time. I do be patient to listen to your whole stories. Here's another question that uh, what kind of advice do you have for future generations who hope to contribute to building a global mindset? I think yes. the very important thing is national pride, but without that national pride doesn't, need, doesn't mean um, uh, nationalism. It means patriotism, it means respect for your own country, respect for yourself, but respect everybody else. The, the word I like to use is empathy, but the empathy is to say empathy. And I think the empathy or the most empathetic thing you can do is to try and put yourself into somebody else's position and understand mm. that their experience is different to your experience. You're there doing something differently to how you might do it, but both systems can work. And this is the biggest thing that I found when I, I studied this and, and you know, I, I interviewed hundreds of senior CEOs and managers, both Chinese and Westerners, and came to this conclusion for, for my dissertation a few years ago, which basically said, we don't need to change, just need to understand others. So learn a little bit about national identities, cultural identities, Learn a little psychology. If you're going to be managing in a foreign country, there's a mm. couple of people that you can sit and trumpeters and people like this who really are experts at this. Learn what mm. Chinese people do that is different to what your people do, wherever you are from. And Chinese mm. people can do the same thing. Learn what other countries would do. And we know that we are more individualistic and you are more communal. It works differently. Mm. Yeah but it works yeah. very, very well. And the different yes. approaches don't have to be, not one of them is wrong and one of them is right because things work in both systems. Let's learn yeah. from each other's systems and accept that the other one is better. Not Sorry, not better, is equal to, not mm -hmm. necessarily better. It's about a mutual understanding and mutual learning, right? To learn from each other. How about Zach? How do you, what, what advice do you have for younger generations? Is to first, you know, understand each other's habits and then go from there. For example, you know, in China, um, in comparison to um, Americans, especially, is that when we talk about business, we don't, we, um, they, they want to first get to know you at the beginning. They, they want to talk with you, ask some personal questions have some small talk to build that rapport. And then maybe after the first, second, or third time of meeting together, then you start to talk more and more business. And then you can start to work together. So the, so which is completely different um, to, to the American way of doing it, which is I wanna do this, this is my goal, this is your goal, we have the same, we have the same ideas, let's do it. Even if we don't know each other really well, as long as we have the same goal, then it, nothing else matters. Immediately when you start to, you start to think, you start to feel that you have some judgment. You start to feel, you know, you get frustrated. Well, back home, I always do, I, we always do things this way. Or, you know, you, you start to, um, you start to get really centered around like your own experiences your and your and, and you're kind of in your own bubble you need to step outside of it broaden your horizons and then from there i think this will lead to a brighter you know a brighter tomorrow and a better world that we all want to be part of i know it's easier said than done and i'm sure that jerry under knows this as well like nothing happens overnight but with these little steps these little purpose purposeful steps to inch towards, you know, more inclusiveness instead of exclusiveness, more diversity instead of monoculturalism. And, and just taking these small steps, we can already get, we can all reach the same goal together and, mm -hmm. and be successful or, you know, at least have a better world than we had yesterday. I would actually like to ask Jerry his thoughts 
um, and also hear a little bit more like what do you feel is a global mindset? Because I feel like this word among many others is kind of vague. I mean, it, it sounds very self-explanatory, but actually like every person's uh, interpretation of it's a bit different. So I'm wondering what's your take on it? It's a really interesting question. I, I think the, there's something called dimensions of culture. It's a, it's a question you've asked and the answer has been something you didn't want to hear. So ask the question a different way. Ask the question, uh, you know, set the scenario differently and you'll usually find you can get the answer. TIC, this is China. Now, I think that applies globally. This is the world. It's different out there to what it is here. And I think that's the important thing. I mean, we just had a, you, you, I know you're not really into politics, but we just had a huge global deal with Saudi Arabia and Iran and China shaking hands right. for the first time in 20 years. And I think that's mm. the, the, what's happened there is China is doing exactly what you said earlier on they could do and should do. They, mm. they take information, they understand it, they listen to it, and they give suggestions, but they don't impose their ideas on people. The mm. humility of Chinese people is like this. For China, it's really all about win-win and trade. It's not, a, it's not about power. And mm. that global thing around the world, every single person is different, but every single culture is different. And that happens in China too. The Guangdong culture is different to the Yunnan culture, yeah. which yeah. is different to the Beijing culture. Uh, right. It really is. We've just got to understand that our cultures are different. And mm. that's really the, the important thing. When people joke around saying, oh, when, you know, what are your good China days like? What are your bad China days like? Well, we're all going to have good and bad days in any country. But I think, right. I think it, as long as we have this mindset, you know, what is our goal? What is our purpose for being here? I have one last point that I would like to mention. Mm -hmm. I think that I think that it revolves around language. And I would say that no matter which country you go to, but especially since we're talking about um, foreigners living in China and the Chinese experience, that when you come here, I recommend that every foreign national take the opportunity to learn Chinese. When you take the, when, when you purposely go to learn a language and connect with other people, it, it opens up a lot of doors. Um, the, I, I think of a quote, when you speak to another person in their second language, it goes to their brain. But when you speak to them in their native language, it goes to their heart. And I think that yes. this in many yeah. ways is also a key nice. to cross-cultural communication. Yeah, that's really a nice quote. I'm going to re recite it. Very I'm going to remember that. <laughs> Thank you so much for your both of your thoughts, and I really appreciate that. Uh, as I've mentioned, that cross borders isn't about going to cross borders in the mind, but it's more about extending your borders and creating new ones around us. So if we are creating a new culture, that is not easy, as what we've mentioned over the past hour, that is not easy. But this is what we call a global mindset, and that is what makes the world go around. Thank you so much. That was really a nice conversation. So I think, I hope that we can make it in Beijing and Zhongshan. Thank you for joining me, and I'll see you next time.